This is Courtney. This is Kimberly. You are listening to the show within the show, Living on the L Edge. Come live with us. We're talking about the road to recovery and sobriety and how to vibe and maintain a happy and healthy lifestyle. Hey, welcome to the Sober Vibes podcast. I am your host, Courtney Anderson, and it is a living on the L edge today. You are listening to episode 87. A couple announcements, though, before we get into this episode today. I'm doing my next free workshop on Thursday, the 28th at one o'clock. Check the link in the show notes so you can sign up for the next workshop. I did one a couple weeks ago. It was fun. I hope it helped you. So feel free to join again and it will definitely be a different topic. So check out the page and sign up. And then the day of, of course, I was going to do it in the Facebook group last time, but then I got extremely, me and that Facebook sometimes are just not friends, but I think a lot of people on Facebook are just not friends, (laughs) but I wanted to do it in the Sober Vibes group. But I was concerned it wasn't safe to send out. So last minute, I switched to Zoom. Anyways, you will get the information a couple hours the day before. But don't worry. Don't stress. If you cannot make it 1 o'clock Eastern Standard Time live, I will send out the replay. But you have to make sure that you're signed up for that list. Second, two, if you are a fan of Organifi, they have just released a new Organifi the Greens, but it's Crisp Apple. I've been drinking them for the last couple of days because, you know, in the morning time, that is what I do. I drink the greens t- to start my day. And I had that before coffee. The crisp apple is definitely sweeter if you've had any problems at all. Some, I know sometimes people can't do the, the greens. <laughs> and this definitely tastes like apple juice to me. It's good. So it's a little bit sweeter. Still has all this, the same benefits and ingredients that regular greens does. So check that out. That is limited time only. Again, the link is in the show notes. Make sure to use code Sober Vibes to get at checkout to get the 20% off and save. So try it. It's delicious. Again, Organifi is a great company in your recovery and healing journey. Supplements are huge because we did a lot of damage a lot of damage in our drinking days. So you got to heal that body on the inside. Get into this episode today. This episode is a vintage one because I was had a little bit of cold last week and I just was not, you know, I had to protect my energy. There was only so much I could do with having a cold. So my mom's birthday was yesterday. Mother's Day is coming up. So this is just kind of like a little tribute to my mom. And this was one of my most favorite episodes and my sister too. I know she really appreciates this episode with my mom. And it's just a perspective. If you haven't listened to it, listen to it. If you have, listen to it again. It's a perspective of a mother from addicts. And, you know, being a mom now, it's definitely switched the relationship with my mom and I. And for the better, for sure. And she has been consistently there for me in this whole process of motherhood. And, you know, I tried to do this intro (laughs) twice and I was crying very hard. So I'm going to try not to cry into this. This one, my son loves his nanny. I mean, this kid's face lights up (laughs) when he sees her, which is amazing. So my mom has consistently, you know, been there and showed up for my son and just, I think becoming a mother and seeing some things differently in life, because this is a new perspective, right? And a new role I'm playing, you know, it's just kind of made me see my parents in a different light and more forgiveness on my end has been happening for me in the last almost eight months with them. And just understanding that, you know, we all do the best we can in this lifetime, with the situation we're given, right? So, you know, if you've had a problematic, I'm just speaking towards mother since this episode's with my mom and Mother's Day is coming up and her birthday was just yesterday. It's just the forgiveness <laughs> that all of us can go through. It only helps us in the long run. We're not taking that baggage and just understanding as adults, instead of being like, fuck you, you caused this, you know, just really looking at everyone's perspective. And it was all, all having a human experience here. And 
And from my end, my mom did the best she could with her situation. So, you know, if you still have, and this is where I keep getting emotional and having to stop this. So I hope I don't, I hope I don't have to stop this. If your mom is still alive. And even if you have a problematic relationship with her, you know, just reach out and tell her you love her, make her day, you know, because I'm sure that would make her day. So that's all I'm going to try that to keep crying, but it's something. So, cause I know a lot of people who don't have their moms here and, you know, would change it all in a second to have their mothers here with them in present day. Okay. I hope you enjoy this vintage episode and, you know, L-O-T-E will be back in a couple of weeks. All right, everyone stay healthy and keep on trucking. Hey everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Sober Vibes podcast. I'm your host, Courtney Anderson. And today is the show within a show. It's living on the edge. Yes. 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 Uh, both my sister and I are very excited for our guests today, but just a little bit of a recap. Kim, what's been going on in your life? Nothing. COVID grinding. Mm -hmm. Trying to make it happen. Working and I'm working out with my trainer and trying to train a puppy and trying to keep it positive, you know? Yeah. How is Big Ron doing? (laughs) Dude, Big Ron is the shit. He's the best. Big Ron's my trainer, y'all, and he takes no prisoners. Takes uh, no prisoners. He does jail workouts with you, right? I mean, we definitely get after it. So that is the best thing I've done for myself in 2020 was hire a personal trainer. That's so, I'm yeah. Proud. I'm really proud of you because you've been sticking with Big Ron. Yeah, I'm obsessed. This gym is the shit. And it totally suits my personality. Like, you go in, they're blaring like every day. It's like hip hop. It's high energy. It's like family, you know. So, I'm part of the fam. The let's get it fam. So, I'm- yeah. right. I can't wait. I will be going in there one day. I started back up working out with weights today, so I just want to get myself a little bit more prepared where I don't puke on Big Ron for my jail I mean, workout. Trixie started yesterday with Terry, and she definitely puked in the bathroom. They he got after it with her, so. It's going to happen. You just need to embrace it. And they're just like, get it out. You know, it's, it's, it's poison. You got to get it out. So yeah. oh, there is no judgment in that gym. Yeah. It's prison yard workouts, not jail workouts. <laughs> we get after it. It's intense. It's intense. All right. Well, let's get along with this show. So usually it's just me and my sister talking. On it's the, a big one today, y'all. It's a it big is, one. Is this, big one. This is a big one. And we're really excited. We have our mother. That's right, guys. Our mother is with us today on the podcast. Mom, Debbie. say hello. Hey, everybody. Yeah, Debbie's on the show today. <laughs> Deb's excited. And let's just take a minute because you guys might be very, very confused on who is talking when because we have often heard that all three of us sound exactly alike. I believe that my mom and sister sound more alike than I do with them. Would you agree? That's a that's your opinion. <laughs> you ever- yeah, your opinion, <laughs> Courtney. Excuse me. I'm just saying. I just feel like you and mom sound more alike than me and mom. I'm okay with that. I mean, whatever. Mom's the shit. Mom, is this your first podcast you've ever recorded? My very first ever podcast? Yes. I'm really excited. So now should I say this is Debbie speaking or can I just talk and they'll figure out within a minute that it's me? (laughs) They'll they'll figure it out. Our viewers are smart cookies. So so they'll know. They will. So we, so we decided, we talked about it and we thought it would be a good show coming from the perspective of a parent, particularly a mother of, of addict children of sharing her experience and her point of view, because, you know, addiction is definitely a family disease and it just doesn't affect the person with the addiction. It affects the whole family. And I just hope that this episode helps somebody out there struggling with addict children, child, just to help them feel that they're not alone or that they, you know, that they feel the same way that you have felt before mom. Cause yeah. we definitely put you through the ringer. Yes, you did. <laughs> I agree. Totally. 100%. <laughs> and that's not, Sorry, mom. that's fact. 
<laughs> we love you. Okay. Well, I love y'all. And, you know, I appreciate being able to come on with y'all and be able to give the perspective as a mom with with everything in life, you know, I, I think it's always important to kind of reference who raised you sometimes and just kind of see a perspective of all that was going on. And I always like to share, you know, my backstory of drinking, which I wasn't successful with because I, I remember when I'd go, I was at college and I'd be at a fraternity party and somebody hand me a beer. They always had these kegs around and I would hold that beer all night. And then of course it got warm because I didn't like the taste of beer. <laughs> I never did well with, with the drink and stuff. You know, if I had two drinks or something, I would be throwing up in the toilet all night and it just was never any fun for me. So I think, you know, that's, that has always been my kind of perspective with drinking that it just didn't agree with me for some reason. And I really wanted to drink. I mean, I really wanted to, cause it looked like people were kind of having fun and, but it just never worked out. Of course, in my twenties, I will say that I was pregnant most of the time since, you know, I had four children in five and a half years. <laughs> so I was, so I was always pregnant in my twenties. And so, you know, I just decided in my early thirties that trying to drink just wasn't for me just because for whatever reason, it just didn't work in my system. And so, so it's been interesting for me as y'all's mom to hear things like the term blackout. Sometimes I'd hear either one of you say, you know, I was in a blackout and this, ha I, I don't know what happened. And I'm thinking, I always know what happened. So I'm trying, I was, I've always been trying to understand and have empathy for the different things that y'all have experienced with alcohol, just to be able to, I guess, come from a, an empathetic point of view, just to try to understand. And the more that I would understand, maybe I could find a way to help. Of course, that, that's logical thinking, which didn't really work out with y'all with the drinking. But it was just something that sometimes I thought, I have no idea how these girls get home at night. I have no idea. If they can't remember, how do they do this? And so, and of course, as a mom, you know, moms worry. I mean, that's, you know, it's like, oh my gosh, I just got to keep praying. And so <laughs> y'all are two really prayed over girls. I'll tell you that. <laughs> as well, well, it works. Yeah, it works. As well as your brothers, you know, all I know is I just need to pray more. <laughs> so, but, you know, so it's, so it's something where, you know, I, I admire what y'all are doing. I admire and have 100% respect for anyone who has made the choice of giving up drugs or alcohol and looking to change your life. And so, I mean, because I've seen what both of y'all have done, where you've come from, so to speak, and then how you're living your best life now. And I just, so I just give kudos out there to the universe here for anyone on that path or thinking about going on that path because it's life-changing is what I've seen with both of y'all. And I just want to commend you on that. And uh, so anyway, so that, that's just something where I, I just didn't know what this was all about until I got educated from y'all. And sometimes y'all didn't look like you felt too well in the mornings, you know, and then you're always grumpy and grouchy. <laughs> we didn't feel good. Yeah. So for the listeners, my mom has not drank alcohol since what was that? 88, 89. It was in 87, 87. Mm -hmm. So she has not had one drop to drink of alcohol. And it wasn't because my mom was had a problem with it. It's simply the alcohol did not agree with her system. And there's a lot of people out there who who have had to stop drinking. You know, the stories I remember you tell me when you were in the sorority, and you drank Boone's Farm. Farm apple wine and, and be the lifeguard the next day. Oh. Yeah. And so there was a night where Dub got, got Liddy lit off some Boone's Farm and was throwing up Doritos because she was eating Doritos. So, <laughs> or the bloody, we would have two Bloody Marys when you and dad used to have the parties and for his work. And, you know, you would have two Bloody Marys and you would be violently ill. So alcohol just never agreed with your system. So you have three sober women on a podcast, you know, pretty cool. Yeah. 
<laughs> so it, it's nice. Kim and I have always said that where we really appreciate, we do appreciate and respect you always supporting us and, and coming from that sober perspective. And, you know, I think that what's kind of interesting to me is to look, you know, when I divorced dad, you know, y'all were, let's see, you, Courtney, you were eight and then Kim, you were 11. So I had mm-hmm. four children, 13, 11, 10, and eight. And, uh, you know, I, I just thought that for some reason in my world, <laughs> this is what I thought. I thought, okay, so much for all that chaos going on. Now we're just going to chill out. It's all good, you know. And, uh, and I remember when we were living in the condo, I remember the year that, uh, let's see, 18, 16, Kim, 15, and Courtney, you were 13. So I had four teenagers. And uh, it was just interesting stuff that went on. And, you know, I was, I had my business there in the condo because when I got divorced, I made a conscious choice not to work outside of the home because I thought somebody's got to be in charge of the home (laughs) because of all these children and their ages. And, you know, before y'all started driving, you know, everybody had to be somewhere with sports or whatever. So it, it was a very busy household. So, you know, I, I started my own business in the home. And so we had a lot going on, but I remember that year that I had three or four teenagers and I said, I said to y'all, I stood you there in front of me in the condo. And I said, I said, I said, there's more of y'all than there are me. I said, <laughs> I said, this is not working. That's and I, I remember, I, can't, I, I can't be your mom and your dad. I can, I'm just your mother. That's all I know. <laughs> this, is, this is the best I can do. And, you know, at at that point in time, even with um, all what was going on, I know, you know, like your oldest brother was on the quarterback on the football team, all that coming and going. And it just seemed like there was always somebody sneaking out at night and I had to sleep. I, I couldn't stay up 24 hours to guard the door. And so it just was so much activity happening. And I don't know if y'all know this or not, but it was so crazy with, because I had money in my purse and whatever, I'd have my purse and I'd take it up at nighttime because all the crazy going on and I'd sleep with my purse. That's a true story. I I remember that. I'm sure sister does too. Right. I I put it between my legs. So then I thought, it's not like you just put it on top of the bed. you got to take it in bed with you. And I would sleep with my purse. So no one would take number one, my keys to take my Jeep anywhere. Number two, <laughs> wouldn't take the money. Yeah. Deb, Deb had a fat Jeep. That Jeep was phenomenal. So, sweet you know what? Smooth. We never, we never went for the car keys. Mom. We, never we never went. We never fucked with your precious Jeep for sure. Cause that you love that, but definitely we were going for those those that cash in that wallet i'm I, sorry <laughs> you know we had a checkbook at that time we didn't pay everything online so i mean it was like i had all everything that meant something in the purse in the bed with me and i was and i would think to myself how many other mothers are sleeping like this at night i said i must be the only one but by golly i've heard some stories since then <laughs> the you were you were not the only one but that doesn't make it right. That's horrible. No, I can you go out the window of your bedroom. I would. I have that down to a science. I know. I mean, and I didn't know it. I mean, and I was trying to be so responsible, but sleep at least five or six hours a night. I'm sorry. When did Kim turn into Spider-Man? Were you scaling the wall down at the car? I had to go. Yeah, I just get, I'd go out the window and then my friends would be down like, you know, all the boys that were over and our friends and then they'd catch me from the bottom. Oh my God. <laughs> and so yes. So you had teenage children who post divorce, definitely there was a lot of acting out post divorce. So you yeah. were single mom in it. We would go to dad's on the weekend. And just from from that, you know. I will say this, my mom made our house because how she was raised, she wasn't really my mom's southern. She wasn't really allowed to have, and her parents had come from the greatest generation, my mom's generation, you know, she wasn't allowed to have really people over. It wasn't that kind of house. So we were always, my mom made our home, like where she was always, you know, she wanted our friends there and like, no, 
you know, to come over and to be able to visit or had sleepovers. So my mom always had like kind of an open door policy with like our friends and she knew everyone and everyone was like respectful of my mom. But yeah, when she would go upstairs and go to bed, definitely like out in the garage and in the, we had like this parking lot in the condo. It was just kind of like a meeting spot. It'd be a meeting spot before school for everyone to meet up, to get picked up. And then after school and you know, between us four kids, we were all very social. So we all had a lot of friends. So my mom had to deal with a lot of little suburban misfit motherfuckers coming over. So yeah, and we were the house too. Like we had Kimmy and I had our own phone line. And so we were always two that were friends would lie and say they were spending the night at the Elegant house and because they had a Kimmy and I's phone line. And which Liz did that with her mom all the time. She always told her she was at my house when she was with her, her boo. So yeah, mom but was- I didn't find out about that, Courtney. <laughs> I would have been on the phone with Liz's mom. <laughs> yeah, with, with Marie. But, but yeah, so she grew up in a Southern military home and that there you were strict. You couldn't even wear, you couldn't even wear blue jeans. Deb Not couldn't even wear blue jeans, you guys. When I so. was 18 years old, I used my lifeguard money and went and bought a pair of blue jeans. Yeah. So definitely how she was raised was different in the parenting style that she grew up with. It was different. It was more relaxed and whatnot. And, you know, again, post-divorce, some stuff happened and it just, it just was how the cookie crumbled Mm -hmm. and you were working and, you know, you did the best that you could under the circumstances. And I think I can speak for myself as a mom. And if there's any moms out there listening, I think, you know, because of the love that we have for our children, we always, the intent is always to come from a place of love and then, and to do our very best. It doesn't mean that we don't make mistakes. We make mistakes. We Mm -hmm. fall down, but then we get back up. I mean, so it's, you know, you just keep showing up. (laughs) The next day it's a, all right, let's try this good attitude again. And then, you know, there was times where there had to be some, there's always consequences. Now, when I was sleeping for six hours a night, I don't know, I couldn't hold everybody responsible, but I did believe in consequences to actions. And, you know, there was a time, Kimmy, you know, when you stole those red Jerbo jeans and uh, I found out. Right. You did. My, I stole a pair of jeans and my mom from Jacobson's and my mom found out. And she had me, she took me to Jacobson's and I had to go into like the manager's office that was like by the security office in Jacobson's. And I had to go and return these jeans. So my mom was like teaching me a, you know, a good lesson now that I look back at it now, like I was mortified back then, but you know, and, and the manager ended up not pressing charges or doing anything and said it was the right thing to do. But yes, I had to march my ass back in that department store and go return the stolen goods. <laughs> Well, and, you know, if you think about it, you might remember I was sitting in the chair next to you in front of the manager in the manager's office. And I said, you can lock her up now because I was just adamant you were going to learn <laughs> that there was whenever you do something, then there's something that happens. <laughs> so, right. But I don't think we ever saw those red gerbos again because I asked him to donate it to wherever he wanted to. <laughs> those were a hundred dollar pair of jeans at that time. <laughs> that was just too much. Yeah, back then those were expensive pair of, of denim. Yep. Yeah. Maybe. Maybe. Do you ever remember being high around mom? I remember one time mom came home on <laughs> Friday and I was so stoned to the bone. And I think I had to, to like call you or a page you. I was like, Kim, she's asking me questions. <laughs> Help. Yeah. But I was, I was like stoned all of high school. So then it was just like normal to me. I remember Chad and I one night took some mushrooms and mom was out on a date and she was dating a doctor at the time. And I think he got called. And so her date cut short and it was around Christmas and Chad and I were sitting in the TV room and just like the mushrooms just kicked in and we heard the garage door and we're like, what the fuck? And then mom came walking and I was like, Oh my God, this is my worst nightmare. And Chad just like, couldn't say anything. So I had to carry the room. I was like, all right, mom, we got pizza coming. We're going to go downstairs. Like, Oh, Chad run. Yeah. (laughs) I think that night when she came home high or when I, she, when she came and I was, home, I was high. I think I made you come rescue me in the Honda Accord. <laughs> Get me out of here. I don't feel right. All right. So mom. Well, let but- me just say this to what y'all just brought up. 
Y'all had me really, I didn't know about this stuff. I always said, now look me in the eye. Cause I always thought if I said that, then you wouldn't lie to me. And then by gosh, I knew y'all were lying. I just couldn't figure out what you were lying about. I think that's when I paged Kim immediately, like 911, because she gave me the marijuana and, <laughs> and you told me to look you in the eye and I couldn't, it's like, I froze and I was like, mm. <laughs> yeah, mom just, always said to look her in the eye. And we'd always had to look her in the eye, but it was like, oh God. Yeah. You know, when she said that, that she knew that there was something up. So, so cut forward uh, a little bit of that backstory. So forward to, you know, maybe a little bit more in time when Kim and I were more in our, our active, active addiction in our twenties, more serious in that manner. You know, because I do believe in ki- kids in high school do experiment with drugs and alcohol. It, it happens. So in our serious addiction, mom, like, how did you, how were you able to cope? I, it, like, did you ever feel guilty? Did you ever think like, what should I have done more? Like, how did you deal for somebody who's listening out there right now, wondering this question, how to deal, how to let go, you know, without enabling, continuing to enable the addict? Right. And that's, that's an excellent question. You know, in my mind, and this is just in my world, you know, I, you know, I always was trying to do the best by you and be healthy as healthy as possible, you know, and so I thought, I, they're not, because I never wanted my children to be number one, my drinking buddies, or my best friend. And I say that in a way, because it's like, because I understand my place is at as your, your mom, you know? And so I didn't, and when I said, I didn't want you to be my best friend. When I say that, it means I understood you'd have best friends in your life. And I wasn't jealous of anybody. It was like, that's the way life is supposed to be. And I thought, you know, I haven't taught my children to do this kind of stuff with the drugs and alcohol. And so, you know, I just thought, gosh, I just wish I had chosen a better way earlier in their lives where they wouldn't have, it just wouldn't be such a huge imprint on them. That's what I wished. But again, I can wish everything, but you know, I just got to more dealing with the facts of what was in play right then. I, it was tough seeing both of y'all in your twenties and, and it's just, you know, with Kimmy, Kim, Kimberly, you just make bad choices. I mean, that's what it comes down to. If Kimberly, if you could make a decision, it was always going to be the one that was going to hurt you the worst. And, you know, I mean, I just thought whether it was with, you know, some, a couple of nice guys that I really liked that you were dating and you blew up those relationships and it was just different things. And I, I just was so concerned and Courtney, sometimes I just, I I just wanted to, what could I do about your self-confidence? How could I have you feel better about yourself? I mean, that's kind of how I was approaching it. I know that like Courtney, I remember, you remember that house on Elizabeth street and you know, I get on the demon house and you'd have everybody have all the lights on. So you certainly could see what was happening, but I'd come, you know, I'd come after work and drive by real slow the house and just trying to see if there was any movement and all the lights were on. And then if I didn't see any movement, I would just come up to that front. I'd park my car and it was cold outside. And then I'd come up to the the living room uh, window just to look in to make sure that you were okay. Like you would be okay in my mind if you were like maybe watching the television or eating something and all that. So, and what I was basically doing is just checking to make sure you were still alive. I mean, that's what was going on in my world. And, you know, that's a, that's a tough place as a mom to be. Oh, I think I'll go after I've worked all day and see if she's still alive tonight. And, but that I felt, okay, that was in within my control to do. I know Kimberly, when you lived out in, uh, Denver. Sometimes you would uh, call me in the middle of the night, the phone would ring. And I know there's a two hour time change, but you'd call me and you would be, I could tell by your voice, you were slurring. I don't know if you were on alcohol or drugs or both. I never knew that. And, but I was there to listen. And sometimes you'd be crying and slurring. And then sometimes on a call, you just hang up on me. 
where my frustration was as a mother, number one, I knew you were in the state of Colorado because you, you were in Denver. I didn't know where in Denver. I didn't know who you were with in Denver. I didn't know who to call in Denver besides the police department and saying, my daughter's somewhere in the state of Colorado. And I just like a welfare check on her, make sure she's okay. So again, there was times that that happened where I thought, I, what it, I, somebody's got to help me with this. I always thought, who can help me with this? And I just always felt like I was the only person that was involved in trying to get something done. And that's for a mom, you know, we just want our children to, to in, find the joy in life and to live your best life. That's what we want. I mean, that's all I've ever wanted. You don't, so, and you, you find your passion in life. I always told y'all growing up that you can be anything you want to be. Just, just find what your passion is. And then on top of that, just know you've got to work for it. Those mm-hmm. two things, but be anything. So, you know, nobody was on my radar to be this type of per, this person and work over here or do that or whatever, whatever. You could be anything you wanted to be. So when you, When I think about in your 20s, I was just happy to know you were alive. And that's what it comes down to with all of the and then sometimes you'd use that term like I brought it before, you know, blackout. And I'd hear like, how do you drive home or how do you know what's going on? How do you know you're safe? And because that's just the way I think. And, and then some of the other stuff with the decisions of being out really late and maybe an area that wasn't really where you should have been. And, and it was just scary. I remember being scared and also trying to find solutions. And I didn't, there weren't that many solutions that I found, to be honest with you. Yeah. Organifi is a line of organic superfood blends that offers plant-based nutrition made with high quality ingredients. Each Organifi blend is science-backed to craft the most effective doses with ingredients that are organic and free of fillers and contain less than three grams of sugar per day. Like Organifi green juice with essential superfoods and a clinical dose of ashwagandha, it helps reduce stress and support healthy cortisol levels. Or Organifi gold, a superfood tea that supports rest and relaxation so you can wake up feeling refreshed. Each Organifi blend is easy to use by simply mixing it with water or your favorite beverage while on the go. And they don't compromise quality for taste. I do have to say also both of them are great for supercharging your immune system. Organifi takes pride in offering the best tasting superfood products on the market at a price that works out to less than $3 a day. You can experience Organifi as high quality superfoods without breaking the bank. Go to www.organifi.com slash sober vibes and use code sober vibes for 20% off your order. That's O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I.com backslash sober vibes and use code sober vibes for 20% off any item. I use Organifi green and Organifi gold every day. The greens I use before I even drink my morning coffee. And Organifi Gold I use now at nighttime and I drink it like a, it's like a dessert for me now. I love it. It really does satisfy for me that sweet tooth. And I look forward to both of them every day. The link is in the show notes as well. So I made it a little bit easier uh, for you guys to go to instead if you didn't catch that information of the website. But again, the link is in the show notes. And remember to use code SOBERVIBES at checkout to receive 20% off your items. Enjoy. I'm constantly hearing things like, I don't know where to start. Nothing seems to work. And I have nobody in my life that I can talk to that understands what I'm going through with drinking. That's why I'm so excited about this new app called Lived. Lived is filled with amazing courses, motivation, and support, all delivered by people, including me, who have lived through these struggles themselves and are now living the life they love alcohol free. Lived guides are people who have proven what works and share it through free audio to help you pave your own path towards progress. Download the app via lived.app or head to the link in the show notes of this episode to download the app today. Right. So at what point did you just kind of 
let it go? Or did you always feel that in the state up until the state of, you know, us finally being like, we're, we're done with it. Did that, right. did that sense of relief or relief set in after we chose not to drink and do drugs? Well, I'll put it this way. In your 20s, it was exhausting for me. I was mm-hmm. exhausted from all of it. And then when both of you got in your 30s, I thought, here's what I said to myself. I'm still praying. But I said to myself, those are two grown ass women. Hey, we got a snap for Deb. <laughs> yeah, two grown ass women in their 30s. We and, like it, Mom. <laughs> and they just need to make a choice of how they each want their life to go. And that doesn't mean I didn't worry, but I became less exhausted because I wasn't actively trying to figure out what I could do. You know, a person of one trying to come up against alcohol and drugs for other people making those choices does not work. And so no matter what we, we can only offer help, you know, certain things for you to be involved with and all that. But it comes down to the fact that I understood by the time you got in your thirties, it was your choice. Mm -hmm. It was your choice. I knew you both had so much potential to be anything you wanted to be and to follow your passion. But you know what? I couldn't do it for you. And that's when I, you know, I just, just turned it over to God and said, you know, and surrendered it. Right. And no, no mother wants to bury their child. I mean, that's, that's a given right there. So, I mean, that's, you know, that's not on the list of things that you'd ever say, well, you know, maybe they're going to die. I didn't know what y'all were going to do. Either one of you. I just know that, you know, like for things to change, you got to change for things to get better. You got to get better. My mentor, Jim Rohn told me that one time. And you know what? I just said, it's up to them. They got, they have what it takes to do it. They just got to want it bad enough. Yeah. Mom, do you have any self-help books that you read during that time for, with, with letting go or something that you would recommend for parents of, of addicts and alcoholics? Well, I had to, you know, I had to identify myself that Melody uh, Beatty book had an impact on me in the nineties. Codependent no more folks. One of the right. best books of all time. Right. Cause I had to identify myself, you know, I did identify- when you say identify yourself as the role you played, is that what you're saying? Absolutely. Yes. You know, so I had to identify myself to know what, cause you know, we were all showing up at a dance when I would show up with you, Courtney, you were doing a dance. I was doing a dance. When I'd show up with Kimberly, Kimberly, you were doing a dance. I was doing a dance. So it takes two to get involved in this type of relationship. And even though it's from love and the best of intentions. And so when I tell you I was exhausted when y'all were in your 20s, I was exhausted from it. We're all for my children. I was exhausted. And so and I thought, man, I spent all that time raising them as a single mom and doing my best. And I'm exhausted. What is going on here? (laughs) I thought by then I wouldn't be exhausted. (laughs) And so, but no, I identified, you know, the, my part I was playing. I can't really, I don't really believe I did. I, uh, you know, I never gave you money to enable you for drinking, you know, I mean, and I, since I didn't drink, I mean, you wouldn't have come to me for anything in that area because it's just not ever been really my lifestyle and so so it was like and I sometimes I'd say to y'all you know I like to have fun too and Mm -hmm. I would you know it was kind of in your 20s it was like if you weren't drinking you weren't having fun so then if you're with a person who doesn't drink you don't really hang with them very much and that's why I would tell you i I like to have fun too, you know, do something fun, go to a concert or whatever. And uh, because it's important to know that we're all human beings. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, with the family bond, you know, it's the love is so deep I have for, for, for my children. And I have to say, you know, in looking at my life and where I am now, you know, I'm absolutely 100% grateful for my life. It's, it's been filled with blessings and it's also been filled with an abundance of lessons. Mm-hmm. And to say, would I change it? No, no, 
because being blessed with four children, even with all that goes on with four children, it's still a blessing. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, because we we don't get a chance to have a do over. And it's just how we live our lives. And so once I started to look at chaotic things that would trigger me, I, I started to back off, back off, back off. Doesn't mean I wouldn't answer the phone in the middle of the night or whatever, but I would identify it as a, it's chaos. And for me, chaos was, you know, that's why I divorced dad to stop the chaos. And I'm still dealing with, with the chaos. So I just had to say, I'm not part of the dance anymore. Yeah. Well, and you all, you did, you had healthy boundaries. I will say that with, with that, I feel from my end, I feel like toward in those days, you, you did have healthy boundaries right. with us. Would you agree, sister? Yeah, I would agree totally. And, you know, it, it makes me <clears throat> feel bad because it's like, you know, I remember mom saying that, like, I like to have fun too. Yeah. And it's just like in that time frame. I mean, I was starting to really, really fuel an addiction and jumping off into like full, full addict. So I didn't really, you know, when mom, mom doesn't drink, mom doesn't do drugs. So like my mind was always like, where can I go to get fucked up? You know? And from her perspective, you know, we have another parent who drinks. And so kind of that's where I, when socially, when I go to hang out with a parent, I'm more socially gravitated towards my dad because he, he, drinks. So I was a full blown addiction mode in my twenties. So to like spend time and to be able to sit down and like not be antsy and to like focus on my mom, it was, it was hard, but then it's like, then it feel bad. Cause it's like my mom missed out on, well, my mom didn't miss out. I missed out on hanging out, you know, with my mom and being present. And that's why like, I'm so grateful that I have at 41, which not a lot of people do, our mom's still with us, you know, yeah. especially right. with all the bullshit we put her through. And it's good that, you know, I'm blessed that she can see at 40, you know, through the past few years, me finally starting to like try and, and, and do an attempt at like a healthy life and like getting it together. Because for so many years, I mean, mom, I'm probably, probably out of all your kids, like, you probably, I mean, I, I, and the percentage wise was not gonna make it, you know? So it's like, just looking back in perspective, it just makes me feel bad because from your perspective, you probably made you feel a certain type of way that we always gravitated towards dad. Like he was like the favorite parent or something, but that was not the case. It was, I was sick and fueling an addiction. Right. And, you know, I, as I started to address the, the addiction as an illness and, and for me, you know, with, with my experience with depression, you know, I always say depression is a cancer of the soul. You know, it's, it's not anything you say, well, I think I'll just grow up and be depressed, but I mean, it's something you actively work towards. And then the alcohol and drugs, the addiction was an illness. So then to me, it was like, okay, and I know what I actively do for the depression. It's an active part of what I do, like with the walking and the exercise and being engaged with people. I mean, all this is very important that deals with an illness of depression. So I thought, you know, my daughters are sharp. They can figure this out. Because if I could figure something out, I know they could figure it out twice as great. And so, and until you're ready to figure it out, that, that's when things happen. And I really believe that the blessing here uh, for both of, both of you as sisters was that the fact that, you know, Courtney went into recovery and has been in recovery now for uh, eight and a half years. And then Kimberly, you know, you've been in recovery for a little over three So I think, you know, so, so somebody might think, well, maybe if, and before everybody went in recovery, but Courtney goes in recovery and then you'd say, well, maybe Kim's going to see how Courtney's doing and maybe she'll just go on in. It doesn't work that way. Everybody's on their own path. Everybody has whatever they've got going on. So, you know, I like the way that Courtney developed her boundaries and her way of dealing with, with 
the alcohol. And then when you got, when you had three DUIs, somehow it must have been a come to Jesus moment. And then you started dealing with yours. Two totally different ball games going on. <laughs> well, you had four. Mom. Well, whenever you came to Jesus, you know, there's that moment there. So, <laughs> and on your fourth one, you did. So, and you know, now, I mean, look at us now. We got our squad, which is both of y'all. And then Matt, Courtney's husband, and we just go do fun stuff every now and then. It's like really cool, you know? And so, yeah. and I can keep up with y'all, especially when we went to the the Halloween deal and I walked just as much as y'all did. And right now. <laughs> you did. Well, and to mom there, I think it was one of the trips you took me on when we went to Hawaii and it was right after high school. And I remember you saying something that always stuck with me and it was a later time of night and you're like, okay, I'm going to go to bed now. And I was like, why are you going to bed? And you're like, well, because you know, the drinking has increased and it's not fun to be the sober one when, after a certain point. And that always stuck with me. And then when I got sober, I always, I always was like, Deb was right, man. Like it's, it's, it's only fun up into a certain point where it's just like, it, it's hard to be around people on planet Pluto when you're sober, you know? Mm-hmm. So I, I get now what you were saying those years, yeah. years ago. Because, you know, uh, the interesting thing about just choosing not to drink, because it it doesn't work for me with my system, but in that, you know, especially, and I've had friends along the way where they go, oh, come on, just have a glass of wine. No, I'm good. I'm going to drink my water. I'm good. You know, and that's what I say. And then they go, oh, you know what? You'll feel better if you have a drink. And I say, no, I won't, because I know if I have a drink or two, I'm going to end up throwing up all night. That doesn't sound like fun to me. And it's interesting how sometimes I've seen that people just aren't comfortable unless you're right in there with them. And which I, is sad because I just like being discriminated against. It's always like, wait, wait a minute. I'm fun. Let, let, let's just, you know, I'll hang out together. And so sometimes, you know, and I can see how with both of y'all with not, not choosing to be involved with the, the alcohol and the drugs that what happens is you you get excluded. I felt excluded most of my adult life just because of my choice. And, you know, there was just in my choice, but I never was going to have somebody for me to feel like I have to do something to be accepted by people because that's ridiculous. I just rather go home or go to bed early. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Kim, do you want to ask mom anything? Do you have any questions for mom? I don't think so. I mean, we're really just flowing right along here. Mom yeah. is killing. Mom is killing the game on this podcast. Killing it. We might have to have a part two in the few, in season two. Mom, you might just have to come on the show occasionally. You know. Well, I you know I have other stories, but also <laughs> there's lots of stories. But also, I I do want to just say this to be able to give hope to other moms or dads who might listen. Or, you know, Courtney, all your followers around the world and everything, I think, you know, they might even say, hey, maybe I should share this with my mom or dad, this particular podcast, because there's a mom on there. And uh, because there's always got to be, I always think there's hope of bringing a parent back into it, you know, Mm -hmm. in a healthy type of way uh, to be supportive and also to have a better understanding but one of the greatest blessings as a, as a mom is to be able to see both of my daughters living their best life. That's the blessing. And to be able to be a witness to that and see it firsthand and what's going on is the blessing. Mm-hmm. And so, cause, cause keeping, you know, just keep in mind when y'all were checking out with, with the alcohol and everything else going on, I was very much in the zone of knowing everything that was going on. <laughs> and so, so for me, yeah, you, uh, you were proud right. And so for me in this moment, you know, it's a true blessing and I would really like to have other um, moms be able to experience that with the children. And, you know, I never gave up hope. So I, you know, I just want one of the messages to be, there's always hope but the ball is in the adult children's court. There's always hope. Yeah. Would you, would you say mom that the most important thing for your 
quality of life dealing with addict children is for other parents would be boundaries with their children? Well, you, yes, to make it to the short answer is yes. What happens is with adult children, you got to redefine the responsibilities of parenting yeah. because, you know, it's not like somebody wrote a book and said, well, when they turn 18 or 21, you just cut off that parenting stuff. Cause you know, it doesn't happen like that. There's a bit of a learning curve going transitioning from, from high school or college age kids into adulthood for, you know, for the children. So the, the learning curve is on, on me as a parent, like, okay, how do I change this? Well, I don't tell them what to do. I don't make all these suggestions. I try to wait until I'm asked. I mean, I'm just giving you some examples. Yeah. <laughs> what, what I think. And uh, because, you know, I, I really respect the fact we come from different perspectives. Every person on earth has a different perspective of things. And so, and I believe every person deserves to be heard. And so, so, you know, that's kind of how I roll with it. So boundaries are key. And if you're doing any enabling whatsoever, you know, that's, that's a big red flag. And then setting up boundaries, boundaries are, are for the parent boundaries were for me as to not get drawn into the chaos and the drama all the time and, you know, worrying all the time. So the boundaries were to benefit me. You know, it's just like talking about forgiveness. When you forgive someone, you don't do it for that person. You do it for yourself. Well, setting up boundaries with adult children who are alcoholics and addicted, you know, boundaries are for the person who's setting up those boundaries. Mm -hmm. It's just so... It's, it's time as a parent to go on and live the parent's best life. And because if not, I mean, this can go on and on and on. This unhealthy kind of stuff with adult children can go on until the parent passes. You know, that's just what happens. So it's definitely taking responsibility in the relationship as the mom. What was, what am I responsible for? What, what am I doing to make this dance continue? And what can I do to change it? Solid answer. I love it. How do you feel this podcast went, mom? I'm having fun. You are, you are, you are a natural. <laughs> a natural. I all those here. She's been talking all over the world, you know, on stage. How do y'all feel about me being on your podcast? <laughs> I love it. I, I love the perspective and I really, really think that people, you know, I hope some parents listen to this and our people who are listening, you know, they put their parents on and maybe, or pass it to their parents and send it to them because it's just like, it's truth and it's raw, you know, and, you know, with us, we've always been kind of honest with you with what's, you know, not a hundred percent honest when it was happening, but you've always known what the deal is with your kids and where we're at in life and what we're up to or what we were on or what was happening. So you, I think maybe had a little more, bit more of an insight and edge as to like what was really going on. Cause that was just like our dynamic with you, not saying you approved of it, condoned it, but like you always knew what was going on. So it's always just been you know, kind of truthful, you've known where your your kids are at. Plus, you're so intuitive and aware. Even if we did try to hide something from you, you just you always knew what was going on, you know? Yeah. And I mean, you really hit it dead on when you talked about my self confidence and Kim's bad decision making. But that is spot on. That one made my stomach turn of like, they, you know, and then like, when Kim was talking, that one made me cry. I was tearing up over here because it is. You just don't think about this stuff until you have some clarity and some time away from it. And like, all right, this is, this is what, and to hear and be able to hear this, it's, it's also probably has healed a little bit of us, all three of us here. You know? Yeah. And as an active addict, you don't really, you know, the addict brain is very selfish. You're going to do what you're going to do to get you through the day with what you need to feed it. So you're not really concerned about how it affects others, how it makes other people feel, how other people, you don't care how other people are reacting to it. You're just very much like in your lane because, you know, you're sick and it doesn't mean your heart's not good, but, you know, to listen to how it affects someone, especially like your mom and everyone has a mom, you know, so it just, it's, it's good to hear 
Cause it's like, and then it's growth. I mean, there's a lot of people who don't have this relationship with their mom, but healing can be done. And if you want to like sit down and, and do the work, I mean, my mom and I have had some uncomfortable conversations, some uncomfortable situations and like dynamic and working out that, you know, kind of getting to back respect for each other and love the love is always there. But I mean, after you stop the fuckery and start to get healthy. I mean, there's a lot of, you don't only just heal yourself. You have to heal relationships. And if a relationship's important, you have to face, sometimes you got to face the person and just like, look them dead in the face and just like, this is me and I'm trying, you know? So it's just, you got to, after you get sober, like, it's not just like, Oh, everything just clicks and it's all good. I mean, you definitely have hurt people along the way. There's trust that's missing a lot of shit. So you definitely have to do the work to put in and like be consistent with someone. So, and I would say your parents and your siblings, your significant other, those are like the most like important relationships in life. Cause if you don't have those, then nothing else really matters to be quite honest in my perspective. And I like the way that you brought up that word. Y'all brought up the word healing because, Mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's healing for the three of us. But also, I believe, I believe everyone listening, there's something that can be truly he- healing when you, when you finish listening to the podcast and you pick up the phone and call your mom, there's, you, you, you know, you can send a text or call or whatever, or FaceTime, you know, do something, reach out, it takes five minutes, you know, you don't have to, and it's just part of the healing process because for to reach out and connect with your mom or your dad to connect, that makes a profound difference in your own healing, let alone what it's going to do for your parent. Mm-hmm. Yes, that's true. True. And mom, I'm really sorry for stealing money out of your purse. Yes. <laughs> I, I Kim, really- do you want, do you want to confess anything? <laughs> no, mom knows, mom knows. I'm sorry. I was a fucking disaster. Complete. I would take money from mom. I would take mom's medication. I would go hard in the paint. And, you know, I was always a degenerate for a lot of years. As Joaquin Phoenix said, what did he say, Corny? A scoundrel. <laughs> a scoundrel yeah. in his Oscar speech. But, uh, you know, that's just not a person I'm interested in being anymore. So I just yeah. like, all you have is today and how you conduct yourself. You can only control yourself and how you represent yourself to others in relationships. And, you know, that's where I'm like, trying to do the work and just stay consistent. Right. So, well, I'm going to, let's leave it at that. This was a great first dub series, many more to yes. come in the future. <laughs> Welcome to the Thunderdome mom. Fuck yeah. <laughs> Deb- oh, <laughs> yes. D- Debbie Elledge in the house. So thank you so much for everybody listening. Mom, thank you for your truth. Sissy, thank you for your truth. And, you know, for everyone listening, thank you for listening. If you haven't yet, please rate and review and make sure to subscribe to the podcast so you never miss an episode. Love you very much, mom. Love you, ma. Love y'all. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.